Good evening. This is May 8th, 2000 here in Natick, Massachusetts. This is part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Program. And this evening we have with us Peter Thompson. Welcome, Peter. Good evening. Do you mind if I ask you your age? Not at all. 55. 55. And what is your address? Street here in Natick. And current marital status? Married. And you have children? Two. A son and daughter. Son and daughter. Where were you born? Boston, Massachusetts at the Lying In Hospital. And were you raised in Boston or spent any time there? No. Um, my mother was living with my uh, grandparents in uh, Wellesley Hills while my father was still uh, fulfilling the uh, end of his uh, military obligation in the Army. He didn't actually get to see me until I was uh, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, five or six uh, months old. Tell us a little bit about your dad, um, military obligations and uh, what, what was his training? Well, he was a uh, medical doctor, actually uh, a general surgeon, and uh, he practiced predominantly at the Newton Wellesley Hospital. Uh, but he also had privileges and uh, actually brought me and uh, some of my siblings up to the Leonard Morse to use the emergency room a few times from cuts and bruises and the like. And uh, he was in the Army when I was born. Uh, he had had his uh, training in medical school accelerated because at that time uh, they were trying to uh, get uh, doctors graduated uh, earlier than they might be ordinarily so that they could uh, help uh, serve in the in the military uh, as, as uh, well and he was in the um, uh, Corps of uh, 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 Army Medical Corps. Mm -hmm. what, and what about your mother? Uh, she was a homemaker and uh, she uh, she was schooled as a, an artist but uh, uh, she took on the task of raising myself and my three other siblings. Did you travel around with your dad as, as part of his military life? Um, no, other than that uh, when he um, was here stateside, he was uh, assigned to the Togus Veterans Hospital in Augusta, Maine, and we lived there for three years prior to coming to Natick. Okay, and uh, when did you come to Natick? 1953. And I, my math now tells me you were age eight. Is that correct? Just, just approaching eight years of age when we moved here, yes. 1953, uh, what was Natick like in those days? It was uh, more of a quiet, uh, agricultural uh, community compared to what it is now. There was still uh, a number of uh, working farms here in Natick. As a matter of fact, there used to be in the building where the uh, um, um, it's up on Route 9. Um, I guess it's uh, Midas Muffler. It used to be uh, Robinson's Farm Machinery. And uh, they used to sell uh, tractors and various agricultural implements there. Um, Route 9 was not nearly as developed as what it is now. And uh, the area that we lived in East Natick, which was termed Oakdale, had a lot of uh, surrounding land that was undeveloped. Uh, Weathersfield was just uh, beginning. And uh, the area of housing along that bordered uh, Weathersfield and uh, Pine Street, um, a lot of the houses on Pine Street itself, as well as Winter Street and so forth, hadn't been built as yet. So you could get on a bicycle and travel just a short distance and you'd see a lot of woods. You're talking about a lot of open space, aren't you? Right. Uh, even, even along Route 9, the area where the Natick Mall and over where Sherwood Plaza and the like is was uh, open except for uh, Right at the intersection of Spean Street, there were a few stores and the fire station. There was a motel and uh, a restaurant, but uh, along on the uh, um, 
eastbound lane, uh, the only thing that was there was Wyman's Garden Center, which was a, mm -hmm. a large nursery. They had a, a place that you could purchase things, but a lot of the land was occupied by uh, uh, young trees and shrubs and the like that were being grown. And what schools did you go to? Well, I uh, went to the East School through fourth grade, then came to the former center school, which had originally been built as a high school, which became the town hall, which is now the beautiful parking lot alongside the municipal uh, offices across the street. And then to the Lilja School, where uh, even though that school had been built in the early 50s, had had an addition put on that. Um, I spent sixth grade there. Then to the Coolidge Junior High School. They didn't call them middle schools in those days, which now is the uh, Natick Housing Authority Coolidge Gardens. Then from there up to uh, what which was brand new at the time, uh, I was the first, with the first uh, class of uh, students that went into the Wilson Middle, middle School. And then uh, from there it was on to uh, Natick High School and I graduated from there in 1964. In 64. And uh, did you go on to uh, college or anything from Natick? I went to a year of college, uh, Lake Forest in uh, Lake Forest, Illinois, but my heart was really into going to uh, technical school. While I was in the high school and even in uh, junior high school, I was uh, active with uh, audio-visual uh, equipment and the like, and at the high school I used to operate the uh, theatrical lighting board and became interested in uh, electrical apparatus and the like because uh, there would be times when we had problems with the lighting board and uh, the electrician used to come in to do some troubleshooting and since I was familiar and usually operated that, we worked together as to uh, me telling them what was malfunctioning and then from there uh, just became interested with the uh, diagnostics and so forth. So I spent two years at uh, Coyne Electrical and Technical School in Boston and while I was attending that school I worked part-time for a, a contractor uh, here in Natick. So, uh, not only did I get the schooling, but I also used to spend my weekends and my summers actually working in the field, so it, it really reinforced what was going on in school. If, if I'm following this correctly now, uh, you're up to about 64 or 65 or maybe a little later? Well, when I graduated from uh, electrical technical school, that would have been uh, the spring of 1967. 67. That was when uh, the Vietnam War was really beginning to heat up. Okay. Um, tell me about that. And now you're, you're in Natick and you're getting this education and, and there's this war simmering and overflowing in, uh, in Asia. Um, did you consider now at this time that you were going to get into the military? Well, <clears throat> There was, of course, the draft. Um, I had held a deferment as a student because of the schooling. And uh, after I graduated from trade school, it was uh, the end of the summer in which I received my <clears throat> draft notice. This is 67? Right. Yeah. And <clears throat> I had already begun looking into uh, joining the Navy in particularly uh, going into the Seabees, which was the uh, construction battalion um, branch of the service, um, in particular because I knew that it would be a place for me to use my training, but also one of the individuals with whom I had worked uh, for the electrical contractor had been in the Navy Seabees. And he comported himself uh, in a very good manner in the fact that um, 
nice guy, uh, really knew uh, the trade, uh, very personable, and we, we talked on a few occasions about some of his uh, duty stations that he had been in uh, while he was in, in the Navy and the Seabees, and I felt that that would be uh, the sort of situation that uh, I'd feel comfortable in. So at this time, did you join the military? I did. I uh, went up to the recruiter's office in Framingham and uh, discussed what my options were, and um, they informed me that I, because of the uh, schooling and experience that I had in the electrical field, that I would be uh, eligible to be what they had called a designated striker. And any person that goes into any branch of the service, uh, like the Army calls it an MOS, uh, the Navy calls it a, a RAID, it's the um, sort of in-service job that you perform. Any person uh, who goes into any kind of a military uh, organization has to uh, be uh, trained as far as uh, military concerns, um, but you also have uh, many times other functions that you uh, are responsible for. And uh, I, I wanted to be an electrician, and um, so consequently, um, they allowed me or, or made it possible for me to, once I completed boot camp, to uh, receive that designated rating. Otherwise, a normal person that would go in would uh, have to go through what they called an A school. In other words, once you, received, once you uh, completed the recruit, uh, recruit training command, you'd be assigned to uh, schooling in a particular field of expertise. But you brought that expertise with you. Into right, so I, I didn't have to go through that training, and I, so I, I went uh, one step up from uh, uh, an ordinary uh, recruit in that uh, they start you off at E1, which is the lowest pay scale or rate. Uh, when you're normally uh, graduated from recruit training command, you become an E2. Uh, but uh, I was, uh, brought up to uh, being an E3, so okay. technically I had uh, uh, a higher, quote, ranking than, than uh, some of the other recruits when I, when I joined the first outfit. Where did you go to boot camp? Um, well, I you, was at you the... Went out of, you, you enlisted at Framingham, and where correct. did you go out of there? Well, um, I actually had to go to the uh, South Boston uh, Naval Annex. That was where we were sworn in. And then we were uh, transported by bus to Logan Airport and went to uh, Chicago via plane. Um, I, I've heard a number of other histories and the individuals went by train. So uh, of course, this stage of the game, uh, things were done by air. But uh, I was at uh, Great uh, Lakes Naval Training Center. Um, I enlisted and went in on, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, it was November 7th of 1967. And uh, Did anybody else, uh, any of your friends or classmates or anybody from NATO go with you? Were you strictly on your own? No, just me by myself. It kind of felt lonely to get out at uh, Great Lakes? Well, it was definitely uh, a change of venue for sure. And tell me, tell me a little bit about basic training. I know most guys say it was tough, and uh, they they try to forget a lot about it. But what what was it like to go through there? Well, <clears throat> it was uh, an instance where immediately uh, once you disembark from a bus, you started to hear orders getting barked at you uh, and to move more quickly and the like. And uh, you have this thought that goes through your mind, what the hell have I got myself into? Uh, Can we but, get a, a, something clear here? When you enlisted in, in the United States Navy, did you enlist for a specific length of time, or did they say when, when the war is over, you'll go home? 
Well, actually, it was a four-year enlistment. Four-year hitch. Yeah. It, there was an option um, for for certain individuals if if you were uh, in the trade. They used to have what they call the direct uh, petty officer procurement program, in which uh, you could enlist for two and a half years. But all those slots were filled. The the quota was uh, used up, so. Uh, my only option was a, a four-year enlistment, but I still felt I'd be better off doing that um, and being able to get more in the way of training, experience, and to do something that I was trained to do um, rather than um, the other option. If I had just uh, allowed myself to be drafted, uh, there's no telling what the Army might have assigned for, for me to do. Did you develop any close relationships uh, with any of the guys you went through training with? I did. Uh, they weren't terribly close because on the one hand we knew that it was going to be only a period of weeks that we'd be in that situation together and that we would be uh, ultimately going our own separate ways because Recruit Training Command was for the whole naval service. It wasn't just for the particular uh, branch of, of uh, Seabees or uh, a person that was going into the fleet or into naval aviation or, or whatever. Uh, but there was a, a one fellow from uh, Lexington, so being from the same general area, we had mm -hmm. some things in common. Do you, uh, did you keep in touch? No, we never did. Um, I think partly because there was just so much else going on and the fact that uh, um, we, we knew that we were going to be going our own separate ways, but uh, um, there were people later on from, from when I was in a battalion that um, I did keep in touch with for a while. Okay. Just for the record, uh, when you got out of boot camp, and uh, the Navy gave you another rating at that time. What were you called? Were you called a, a electrician? Uh, what were you? Well, it was called uh, construction electrician, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I had a sub rate of uh, interior wiring. So that was your specialty uh, during your military duty, right. at least at that time. What did you like or, or dislike about the work that uh, you were doing in the Navy? Well, <clears throat> of course, it took a while before I actually began to do uh, uh, electrical work, per se, because when I first left the Retruc uh, Training Command, which, by the way, it was kind of unique on the one hand, it, our uh, company had uh, been there over Christmas. So they allowed us to go home for a Christmas leave. So the time that uh, we were there at Great Lakes, I actually uh, was able to come home for a week uh, and then on, and had to go back to uh, complete, I think it was like another two weeks of uh, recruit training. That was in, in early 68 then? What, it was just about uh, the first of the year, yes. Yeah. And then I was sent from there to uh, the uh, Construction Battalion Center in Davisville, Rhode Island, which uh, was part of a complex of Davisville and Quonset Naval Air Station. They were actually two separate commands located uh, adjacent to each other. And uh, of course, a Quonset Naval Air Station was uh, a facility that uh, they used for primarily uh, patrol planes, uh, anti-submarine uh, observation craft and the like. When you came east again, did you come as an individual or a part, as, uh, part of a unit? Just as an individual because uh, I forgot how many people were in our company at Retreat Training, uh, Training Command, but um, a lot of them went on to what was termed the A school that people would go to normally that haven't had training otherwise. And uh, some of them would, uh, again, go to, into fleet service, some of them into Navy, uh, aviation. Um, but I, I had orders to report to Davisville, 
And uh, as it turns out, it was only uh, about 65 miles away from here in Natick. So you got home? Uh, quite a bit. Good. Yeah. I was there for a while uh, and stayed right on base, but uh, uh, ultimately I was able to get my car and uh, I traveled back and forth and uh, actually I, I wound up, if you can believe it, while I was in the Navy stationed in Davisville, I continued when I was able to work for the contractor that I had worked for before. If I had uh, some days off or weekends off. I used to work for him on a part-time basis when I was uh, in the States. Otherwise, I used to work um, in the evenings at uh, a service station that used to be located over on Route 9 in East Natick. Yes, and I traveled back and forth a lot. As a young fellow in the United States Navy, uh, and there's a war on in the Pacific, um, it must have been in the back of your mind that someday you may go there or someplace else. Did the services um, prepare you for cultural differences you might face if you left the United States? Did you ever have uh, seminars or classes in other people's culture? Yes, they did. Um, when you were sent from Recruit Training Command to which I was to the 21st Naval Construction Regiment in Davisville, Rhode Island, it was to ultimately join a battalion. And the battalion that I was uh, to be assigned to was MCB-6, which at that time was in Vietnam. And uh, <clears throat> when the battalion came back, the individuals uh, from the battalion itself um, immediately had a 30-day leave. But then when they uh, mustered together again at the Construction Battalion Center, um, it was their job to uh, muster out the individuals whose enlistment time was nearly up and to muster in the new individuals that were being assigned to the battalion. And the way it was set up was that you would have uh, a home port period in which uh, there would be uh, training and uh, preparing for the battalion to redeploy again. And uh, we, were, we were preparing for MCB-6 to redeploy back to Vietnam. They had been uh, in uh, Chu Lai and uh, so consequently uh, <clears throat> we went to, uh, th there was a training uh, facility uh, not too far away from uh, Davisville Construction Battalion Center. It was called uh, Camp Moffat and uh, we had training in uh, the use of uh, arms. Um, the training rifles we used at first were M14s, then ultimately uh, M16s. Now you, were, you were made a part of a unit now. Uh, this was your unit and this was a unit that was going to be deployed to Vietnam, is that correct? Right. Back to Vietnam. Back to Vietnam. Tell us more about this training with weaponry and, and what else did you learn there? Well, the, the camp dealt with training not only in firearms but also uh, tactical maneuvers um, and again dealt some with the uh, culture of uh, the Vietnamese people and the like. And, uh, we spent time there off and on for several months uh, doing anything from uh, shooting on the target range to uh, disassembling weapons, cleaning them, reassembling them, uh, digging foxholes, building bunkers, uh, training with uh, M60 machine guns. Um, we'd go out on uh, war games in which uh, we'd be out in the field for sometimes nearly a week and uh, simulate what it would be like if you were actually out um, on patrol. Um, now this was somewhere near your base in Rhode Island? Right. Where is it now? I think it was in Kingston, Rhode Island it's that in Camp Kingston? Moffat was uh, located. Okay. Looking back from a great distance at your training that you got then, did you feel it was realistic in what 
the men faced going back over into Vietnam? Did they teach you the right stuff? Well, um, they did. Um, there, were, there were a lot of videos as well as hands-on things and so forth. Uh, one of the things, though, that was uh, quite striking um, in the training that, that I wouldn't have suspected that uh, uh, people would ordinarily think that you'd have from watching war movies and the like was, <coughs> excuse me, allergy season. Um, the Vietnam War was uh, termed a guerrilla war. And um, in some respects, it was uh, unfair in the fact that uh, they used a lot of uh, booby traps, um, which uh, might be uh, a tripwire across a path that would be so uh, uh, simple as just uh, dislodging uh, an apparatus that would allow a weighted uh, contraption with uh, sharpened uh, bamboo uh, stakes on it to swing across the path or uh, punji pits where they'd uh, dig holes in a, in a pathway that would be used by individuals, cover it with uh, bamboo and the like and, and camouflage it so it looked like it was a solid path and a person walking across that would fall through and be impaled on the bungees underneath. Now, did did you actually primitive see sort these of weaponry, but very effective and, de and demoralizing to anybody that Absolutely. would happen to run into it? But in your training, did you actually see these things? Did somebody dig these holes, or were they this recreated part of training them films? At, at Camp Moffat? Um, taught you to be uh, very aware, uh, heighten your senses, uh, so that. Uh, you wouldn't just go moseying down a trail uh, without being on the lookout for certain uh, things that might be an indicator that there, mm -hmm. there might be a booby trap. Or, or sometimes uh, you might even take a long pole and uh, move it along in front of you, probe the ground or, or uh, uh, search for any trip wires and the like. Because uh, they wouldn't necessarily need to use uh, regular explosives or firearms or anything else. Uh, you know, very ingenious people. They would take things that uh, were left over from uh, exploded ordnance or vehicles and the like and, and fashion uh, very rudimentary types of uh, weapons out of them. How long uh, that training took you? A couple of months? Off and on. Yeah. We were there uh, on a number of occasions and uh, of course you got to talk to uh, individuals that were in the battalion that had been over in Vietnam that would uh, fill you in on, on uh, some of the fine points of things. But it, it became kind of eerie in the fact that you know, you're not fighting a conventional war. It's not the sort of thing where people are on opposing sides and they're just shooting at each other with mm. small arms or, or uh, artillery and the like. It was uh, uh, a lot of it in the jungle, and of course uh, you're you're basically on their turf, not on your own. Did this battalion ship out and go back to Vietnam? Actually, no. Um, in the latter part of uh, 1968, for whatever reason, um, they decided to have our battalion uh, deployed to. Puerto Rico to Roosevelt Road Naval Air Station. And did you go with them at that time? I did. Actually, I was on the advance party. Tell us about that, please. How did you get there? Well, um, our mission was to, uh, for the whole battalion, was to construct uh, what they termed a uh, ready battalion camp. And the purpose of that was to have any particular battalion that was assigned there uh, to work on uh, naval public works uh, projects associated with Roosevelt Road Naval Air Station because that's quite a large installation. Uh, you may hear some lately about uh, what part of the uh, command uh, is associated with uh, Viegas and uh, Calabria mm -hmm. Islands which are off the shore. and um, It had a large uh, naval uh, contingent as well as also uh, the uh, 
Atlantic fleet. So this was an established base when you got Large there. one. You didn't build the thing. No, anyway, we, right? we built on uh, open uh, area um, a camp for uh, a battalion to operate out of and, and to do constant training. And, and the premise of a, a ready battalion was that uh, you could move any place in the world within 48 hours. Can you give us an example of when you arrived there, what specifically you did? What were your duties? Well, <clears throat> uh, I was on the advanced party. We, we arrived uh, a month ahead of the uh, main battalion. And uh, we had to set up a, uh, a tent city, uh, the sort of thing that you'd uh, have um, if, you, if you landed in any kind of a, uh, a, a virgin area without any kind of facilities. Um, we set up uh, roads, water, um, electrical lines. Um, we set up uh, large squad tents, um, a large uh, mess tent, um, facilities for uh, latrines and, uh, and the like so that uh, uh, when the main battalion arrived, there'd be a place for everybody to uh, bunk down and begin to uh, function independently. We even had uh, field laundry equipment uh, which uh, had washers, dryers, and uh, the associated uh, water heating equipment and the like to uh, be able to do laundry right in the field. So my part of the whole scheme was to uh, get all that stuff hooked up. I even wound up doing some uh, telephone work because we also had uh, a telecommunication system in the camp as well as uh, public address system and the like so that uh, the most important thing for it was to blow Reveille in the morning and to play colors at night but uh, other than that to, to make announcements and the like. So it was kind of interesting. You said a minute ago that you were part of an organization that was prepped to go any place in the world in 48 hours, is that what you Correct. said? What would your duties have been to wrap up and take off with this group? Well, <clears throat> The camp itself would remain, but we had uh, containers loaded with uh, the equipment that you would need to set up uh, a similar facility. We also uh, had uh, frequent inspections and drills and in that uh, they'd announce uh, any time of the day or night that uh, prepare for mount out and essentially you had to gather together all of your personal belongings and gear and uh, we'd uh, ultimately muster actually on the dock as if we were going to uh, load immediately aboard a ship. Uh, they also um, had the facilities there to uh, load heavy equipment, be it uh, dump trucks, uh, bulldozers, uh, smaller vehicles and the like. and. Uh, uh, respond again to uh, any place in the world. Of course, nowadays a lot of that would be done by air, and even even in that time they would have too. But I was going to say, if you went by ship, you wouldn't get very far in. in the very large hours. pieces of equipment yeah. would go by ship. And you guys could be any place in the world in 48 hours. That was the theory. Luckily, was uh, it ever carried out to reality? No, um, but it was it was part of the. Uh, strategic planning at the time because we were still not only dealing with the Vietnam War but we were also dealing with issues of the Cold War too. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, the, 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 the Vietnam War took precedence over uh, most people's uh, concern in terms of the military and so forth but there was still a lot of other hot spots in the uh, world where uh, there were struggles ongoing. You know, likewise, there, there are things ongoing now in Africa and the like that uh, you don't hear about a lot on a day-to-day -day basis, but the, the world can tend to be a volatile place. So you, you folks uh, could have gone any place except Vietnam and still been in a lot of troubles, places in Central America or South America? 
uh, any of the islands in the Caribbean? Yes, and uh, it wouldn't necessarily have to be an armed conflict. Um, it could be something like an earthquake. Uh, let's say the types of things that have occurred in Turkey, um, Japan, and the like. In fact, we did some uh, humanitarian aid in Puerto Rico during the time I was there. We had some, uh, um, I believe it was like uh, late 69, early 1970, uh, very, very long period of very intense rain where uh, there was a lot of flooding, a lot of uh, native uh, Puerto Ricans' uh, homes were flooded and the like, and we used uh, uh, six by six uh, all-wheel drive troop transport trucks to uh, evacuate people and take them to higher ground, as well as also uh, there were some of the uh, uh, amphibious carriers which uh, Term ducks, which you see around now in Boston mm -hmm. uh, on the duck tours, uh, yeah. evacuating people. Um, and <clears throat> the military did it in a humanitarian capacity, but it was also um, good training for us to respond to, to things because you, you don't necessarily get handed a script um, with your parts identified and everything all orderly. It's, uh, when something uh, drastic happens like flooding and the like or um, earthquake or something of that nature, um, you have to do what's required. You had to be pretty flexible, didn't you? Right. Yeah. How long did you stay down there? Actually, um, <clears throat> including the time I was there for the um, advance party through um, the return, I was there for about ten and a half months. And where does that bring you up to uh, in, in the time of your enlistment? That was um, the spring of 1969. 69, and you have about two years to go, is that it? Uh, right. Yeah. And uh, I know when I, I came back from uh, Puerto Rico, and uh, <clears throat> I happened to uh, get home, and, and uh, at the time, um, I was uh, dating uh, my wife. Um, it was surprising when we got back. For days, I walked around with a jacket on, and everybody else was running around, you know, in T-shirts and so forth up here because of the difference in the in the uh, weather. Of course, down there in the tropics, uh, much warmer than what it was up here. When we got back, um, if my recollection serves me correctly. I think it was uh, right around this time of year. When you Although it wasn't as warm as it is today, because I might note for the people that are viewing this tape today, we got up to about 90. Yeah. When you say you came home, did you come back to Rhode Island again, the same base? Correct. So I was part of a battalion which then was coming back from, they, they considered it to be sea duty. See, because in the Navy, even though the Seabees is pr predominantly a land-based operation, the Navy just, everything is, is uh, uh, by virtue that it's uh, originally dealing with things involving the sea, they turned it sea duty. It was any time that you were on duty that you were away from your uh, home port base or that you were uh, attached to a, an active duty unit. It was like being out to sea in a ship. That's the way they considered it. So we were coming back and at that time um, I had been in the Navy for over a year and a half, and <clears throat> I was um, back and took my leave, and the battalion assimilated the uh, new individuals that were joining us, and uh, again preparing for um, ultimately a, a another deployment, because we were scheduled to um, be going again on deployment uh, in the fall. And again, at that time, we were surmising that it would be Vietnam. All this while, I'm sure you heard what was going on in Vietnam. What was the conversation about that? Well, <clears throat> you could see a lot on the news on TV. It was more difficult to see TV in the area that we were in, in uh, Roosevelt Roads, uh, but still, uh, 
you'd get to see some of it. You, you'd see uh, newspapers. Um, of course, I'd be writing letters back and forth to uh, my girlfriend at the time, uh, who later became my wife, uh, my parents, and, and uh, acquaintances. And uh, it was during that time that the uh, Vietnam War was being looked at uh, less than favorably by a lot of the populace here in the United States. When we originally um, joined the battalion, it was still um, an action that most people felt was justified and that we were helping the Vietnamese people. Um, but the tide had turned, particularly um, after the Tet Offensive in 1968. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it was because uh, the, the footage that people here in the United States were seeing was um, of, of uh, that which the media was recording uh, in Vietnam. And of course, uh, you had a certain amount of idealism with college students here in the States, but you also had a certain amount of people that just didn't want to uh, wind up having to put on a military uniform and go anywhere. Can I ask you a, a, a personal question here? How did you feel about this, seeing it on television, seeing the, the riots at colleges and things like that? Was there any resentment in your organization, or, or how, did, what, how did the people react to that? Well, there was, because um, out of all the friends that I had uh, that I knew from high school, um, I was the only one that was in active military duty. A number of my friends had deferments for medical reasons. Um, a number of people um, had uh, become uh, enlisted in the National Guard. And uh, there was a certain amount of uh, resentment about, I'm serving the country doing this, and it was as if you felt that people weren't behind you, they didn't appreciate what you were doing, and it became uh, a great deal of unease, in particular when uh, I'd leave the base at Quonset Davisville, there were times when there'd be protesters at the gate, and uh, times when I uh, found that I was having uh, rotten fruit thrown at my vehicle, being called baby killer and the like. Um, Does the fact that your father was in the service, did that have any bearing on, on your attitude toward the military? Well, I felt that he had done his duty. Um, I had a certain amount of patriotism and love for my own country, as I still do now. I felt that uh, I was called to do my duty, and it was my duty to go and do what was asked of me. And uh, I felt at the time that uh, I was doing what was uh, morally right. But um, I felt a great deal of conflict, um, particularly when it became uh, uh, necessary to change out of my military clothes to come home because uh, you, you, you'd find yourself uh, getting into uh, confrontations with people that were just off the cuff, even if you went in some place to buy a cup of coffee or whatever, start to uh, rail on you about the war and so forth. And you're not a policy maker, you're doing what it is that you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. See, they didn't know anything about what I was doing, what the people that had been uh, in Vietnam from our battalion had done before. They, they built schools, they improved roads, they improved utilities, they did a lot of uh, community um, access type work with the Vietnamese people. We didn't go around shooting people. But that was the sort of image it, that it was an unjust war, that the uh, uh, people in the military uh, in that era were out of control, that were going around shooting innocent uh, civilians and the like. Of course, um, you couldn't tell one player from the other a lot of times uh, in country um, because um, you, you might have a person that was working in a capacity 
in a camp there were oftentimes civilians from the Vietnamese population that would come in and do things like uh, laundry and cleaning and work in the mess hall and so forth and um, you know, be very friendly to you and the like during the day and yet they'd be pacing off uh, distances between points and giving the information to uh, the Viet Cong so that they'd know where to aim their uh, mortars and artillery you know, for an attack at night. And you still had two years left to go in your hitch when you're going through all this confrontation and conflict. Right, and I, I used to resent the times when I was called up for duty for uh, uh, crowd control and the like when it should have been my quote liberty time that I had time off and, and have to be out there uh, training for or, or facing protesters at the gate. This was in Rhode Island. Right. How long did you stay in Rhode Island this time? We were there for um, quite a period of time. Uh, I'd say it was about another year because, uh, or nearly a year. Um, the reason being was uh, they transferred me to uh, internal security while the battalion was still getting ready to go on uh, another deployment and then... Uh, was this in addition to your regular duties or something separate? Well, it was what they called a temporary assigned duty. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was on shore patrol and Davisville Construction Battalion Center had its own, uh, own civilian police department. but. Quonset Naval Air Station used uh, shore patrolmen, so I was transferred there. So I was actually uh, uh, akin to a police officer in a, in, a, in a town. We used to do uh, traffic uh, enforcement, uh, uh, ticket speeders, uh, do investigations in uh, Is naval this a housing. Navy uniform. Yes, uh, rather than, I, I might say that the normal uniform that I wore in the Seabees uh, was uh, uh, marine uh, fatigues, because we, we hadn't touched on it, but I also went to marine training at Camp Lejeune. But uh, when you were on shore patrol, you dressed in uh, either dress whites or dress blues, uh, traditional Navy uh, tunic with the flap that came out in the back and uh, bell-bottom trousers and the like. And uh, then they, they put me on duty on shore patrol outside of the base. And we used to cover for, uh, down to Newport, Rhode Island and up to Providence, Rhode Island. Um, we used to patrol the beaches and around the city. And <clears throat> if there should happen to be a call of uh, um, a sailor or a person in the Navy that was uh, in some sort of trouble, whether it be drunk and disorderly or, or something of that nature, um, the local police would call us and we'd take them into custody and just try to get them back to their ship and mm -hmm. uh, get them straightened out. Um, sometimes we wind up putting people in the brig if it was a serious offense. Uh, we used to deal with some instances of uh, um, spousal abuse, uh, drug overdoses and the like in uh, Navy housing because there was a large amount of uh, Navy housing adjacent to uh, Quonset uh, Naval Station for people that were married. And, How did uh, you like that duty compared to what you were doing before? Did you hope that would be over soon and you'd get back to your, uh, your training? Well, I liked actually doing electrical work. Um, I didn't mind shore patrol all that much because it gave me a chance to get out and around and see some sights. As a matter of fact, I used to carry a camera with me and uh, take f uh, photos of uh, interesting scenery that uh, you get to see. Like down around in Newport, there are a lot of uh, mansions and, mm -hmm. uh, and the like. Um, Providence never really struck me as being a world-class city. Now I, I understand from what you see on TV and the like, it's uh, had a renaissance, but uh, on the beaches and so forth. And uh, the thing that I used to like about that, it was a, uh, um, a type of duty where you'd be on for three days, off for four, on for four days, and off for three. So we used to be able to schedule some uh, time off 
by that time, I'd, I'd become married, and uh, my wife you, and you, I... You skipped over that. Yeah. When, when were you married? Um, in uh, 1970. Okay, that's the, the year, year you're talking about. So uh, she stayed home because she was a, a college student, and I used to have a trailer that I uh, lived in with another fellow that was in our um, company in, uh, in the battalion. And uh, he had a, a truck camper, so on certain occasions, I'd take the trailer with my wife and we'd go away for three or four days on a, on a trip up to New Hampshire or whatever. And uh, he'd stay himself down there, and, or I'd, I'd, I'd work for the contractor that I used to work for. What was your Because we used to be on time? duty in shore patrol on that stretch for 12-hour shifts. What was your rating at this time? Uh, Construction electrician third class, which was uh, a petty officer position. So, um, I had I was eligible and I had passed the exam for second class. But in order to receive that, would have meant uh, extending my enlistment. And I had decided that I was going to, uh, when my enlistment was over, uh, rejoin the civilian population and and. Uh, resume, you know, building a career. This, you're about to, in 1970, you're about less than a year away from your enlistment being up. What did you do f for the remainder of your time? Well, <clears throat> um, believe it or not, they sent us back to uh, Roosevelt Road Naval Air Station. At that time, I had been transferred uh, MCB-6, which actually I have a, a SEAL um, we talked before about the CBs, but this was the uh, insignia for that particular battalion. You see it has the There's rope this. six and the bumblebee, and uh, this is the CB uh, insignia. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that it has a, a machine gun, wrench, uh, hammer, held by the other legs. Um, it was principally supposed to be a, a support type of uh, an organization as opposed to strictly combat. We were, we were trained to defend ourselves if the need be, but we didn't aggressively go out and uh, try to engage the enemy for combat. But uh, the the Battalion 6 was decommissioned and I was transfer transferred to MCB-1. We were sent to uh, Roosevelt Roads Naval Station again to the ready camp. And uh, shortly after we arrived there, I was transferred to uh, the uh, Naval Facilities Command in Thurmont, Maryland, which actually was Camp David. Uh, they didn't refer to it as Camp David on documents, but, but that's what it was. You might explain what Camp David is at this particular time. Well, it's in the mountains in Maryland. It's the presidential Pledge retreat. Of, yeah. And uh, it's a uh, very beautiful uh, uh, setting. Um, but... Uh, I was assigned there with a number of other people. Uh, there had been an individual who had attempted to enter the compound. He had made up a rig with a, uh, a pulley, a crank, and a staff that enabled him to climb a telephone pole, attach it to the overhead wire, and crank himself across the uh, security perimeter. Well, he was caught before he got all the way across because they have uh, a marine guard with uh, uh, dogs and the like that patrols the perimeter. Who was president at this time? Uh, Nixon. Richard Nixon. Did you ever see Nixon or yes. any of his family? Only, only from a distance. But the individuals that were there, um, in order to work at the camp, had to have uh, presidential clearance. So. Ta -da, I had a White House clearance for a while. <laughs> but uh, our job was to bury the utility wires underground into the camp, also to uh, 
strengthen the uh, security system around the camp. We installed a uh, balanced pressure system which was uh, tubes filled with a liquid that uh, had antifreeze in it so it wouldn't freeze as well as an electronic grid so that if anyone walked across the area or um, passed through with any kind of metal uh, either the pressure of the ground moving or the um, metal grid would, would signify someone was trying to get in. There was also a set of two fences and an electrified grid down the middle of that which anybody uh, that was to try to go through that area would be electrocuted but they just felt that due to many different factors, one of which was the protests against the uh, Vietnam War uh, and the like that uh, the security should be heightened. We also put up all new uh, security lighting around the perimeter that if there was any particular area that they had concerns or if they had um, an alarm that went off automatically the lights would come on to illuminate the area. All of the underbrush uh, and forest was cleared back um, in the neighborhood of a hundred yards so that there was a clear field so that you could see if there was anybody out there. And you used to have deer that would set off the, uh, <laughs> the balanced pressure right. system. It worked. Yeah. Uh, you must have seen some famous people while you were there. All right, this is a question. Did you see any famous people while you were um, there? Henry Kissinger. And uh, for a while there, nobody knew where President Tu from uh, Vietnam was. He was up there. They also had us upgrade the uh, walkway lighting system so that uh, they could go out and uh, walk along the pathways at night. Uh, I got to see. Uh, Julie uh, Nixon and David Eisenhower. As a matter of fact, we got into trouble one day. We were working and uh, they came by holding hands. And at the time, there was a song that was popular, uh, Julie, 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 do you love me? We started singing that and uh, later on they were trying to uh, redress whomever was responsible. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking behavior. <laughs> Did you serve out your time there? and? Uh finish up your time in the Navy? Uh, well, actually, I made a few stops. I, uh, I was sent from uh, Thermont back to uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, they had me do some work for a while at the uh, San Juan Naval Station. Then um, they sent me to uh, the Panama Canal Zone and I can't remember the name of the station. It was on the eastern end of the canal. And uh, of course the canal zone is very narrow, follows the, uh, the canal through. And we used to be uh, <sighs> headquartered in an area where we, we slept in uh, huts with a tin roof and screens for the exterior walls because it's uh, tropics down there. It's right near the equator so um, it's warm there all the time and uh, used to be able to look out through in the evening and watch the lights of the uh, ships going through the canal. That must have been quite a sight. Yeah. I was out there working on uh, um, tower uh, lighting and, and uh, power supplies for communications towers that were in the canal zone that uh, were used to uh, communicate with, uh, they, they had come up with a new system where they could actually communicate by radio with submerged submarines. Hmm. And did you, where did, any other stations after the uh, canal? Um, my final uh, duty station uh, was uh, uh, again Davisville and by that time when I came back, because there was a question as to when I was going to come back because uh, when I was in the canal zone the, uh, um, our battalion was due to go back to the States in uh, later May, around this time of year. And theoretically, I was supposed to be going with them. But they put an operational uh, hold on me, um, which the government is allowed to do, that if, if you're considered to be um, essential to an operation that's in national interest, uh, they can keep you there. Well, one of the times that I was in Thermont, Maryland, I had snuck home and uh, my wife was expecting our first child. 
and I had been looking forward to, he was supposed to be uh, born in uh, uh, late July. And then all of a sudden they told me I was going to be uh, staying there in the canal zone, so I, uh, I got a little bit uh, bummed out about that, but ultimately uh, things worked out. I, I was able to get home in time for him to be born. And then when and where you di uh, were you discharged? Um, discharged from Davis, Rhode Island, from uh, the Construction Battalion Center in uh, June of uh, 71. I, I would normally, my, my enlistment would have been up in November, early mm -hmm. November, actually November uh, seven, uh, 6th. But at that time, I had so much, quote, sea duty that uh, they couldn't send me away anywhere else. They'd have to find uh, a shore billet for me or discharge me. So uh, they asked me if I would accept a uh, an early discharge. And uh, I was willing to do that because I already had a position waiting for me uh, working for the company that I had worked for before. So if you can believe it, the day, that, the day after I got uh, discharged from the Navy, I was at work uh, in Natick. I <laughs> didn't wind up taking any leave. I, 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 I took the money instead of the leave time and right to work. You took the now, money. now in <laughs> retrospect, I wished I'd have taken a month and just done some traveling or something. There were a lot of people that did that. They just, for the, the, the first month after they were discharged, they did traveling. When you look back at uh, what you've told us here tonight and in your own memories, uh, you had a good four years or three and a half in the United States Navy. Was there a most memorable experience in your career? Well, <clears throat> one of the things that affected me the most was uh, that in all the uh, goings on and transfers. There was a point when I had first joined the, the first battalion I was with, MCV-6, that there had been a request from uh, another battalion, I think it may have been 53, that was in Vietnam at the time, that they needed uh, another electrician. So I received orders um, to basically pack my bags and go. I, I, was, uh, I, I came back from uh, Rhode Island. Uh, my uh, girlfriend, which uh, later became my wife, and I went out to dinner. And as far as we knew, um, that would be the last that I would see of her until I returned from Vietnam. And I went back to the base the following day, all ready to go with my bags packed and everything else, and uh, the chief petty officer uh, told me that there had been a change. Well, as it turns out, <clears throat> they had sent me to a school uh, for, for uh, advanced uh, studying in uh, power generation, sequencing generators and the like, and so on and so forth. And uh, I was somewhat of an unknown to them originally because I hadn't attended what was classified as an A school because of my prior experience. So they had me go to a B school on the base. Well, because of the time that I was spending seeing my girlfriend and working uh, until uh, in the evening at the uh, uh, gas station, I would tend to fall asleep in these classes. But it was stuff that I had had for over two years when I was uh, actually in a formal technical school. And so <clears throat> I guess the word, it got back to them that, that uh, I was a slacker. So when they asked for somebody to send, oh, you know, send him, he's falling asleep in class. But it happened that my marks came in and I, I had aced the program. All the uh, answers were right and so on and so forth. So I guess it was decided that they decided after all that they they wanted to keep me. Well, as it turns on, afterwards they put me on the advanced party. Because the people that are on an advanced party are people that 
uh, only have a certain amount of time to get everything ready for other people to, to show up. So another individual was sent in my place. Um, his name was Jimmy Lee Greer. He was a, a fellow from uh, Texas. And uh, he went and joined the battalion of Vietnam and he was killed by a sniper uh, two weeks after he arrived. And when I heard about that, um, I knew him, had done some work with him, done training with him. There had been times when we had slept not more than 10 feet away from each other, you know, in bunks in a squad bay. Um, we'd played softball together, volleyball and the like. And uh, I think I experienced uh, survivor's guilt not to say, had it been myself that had gone, that anything would have happened, because there is a certain thing as the luck of the draw. But that gnawed at me for years, and I would think of him from time to time. And uh, this past July, the uh, Vietnam Memorial Moving Wall came to Holliston. In fact, this T-shirt is a memento of it. And <clears throat> I heard about it in the paper, and I went there. And uh, they had a tent that you could go to uh, that would help you um, locate where on the wall an individual's name was. And it was done um, in the order of uh, when they were killed. And uh, I knew approximately when that was. Because we're talking, you know, thinking back 30 years. Because uh, my discharge was in 71, here it is 2000, it was 29 years ago. Uh, at times it almost feels like it was yesterday, but there are times when it feels like it was a lifetime ago. And uh, they, they directed me to uh, the place on the wall and I took a, an etching or a rubbing of his name and uh, uh, He's down here, uh, Jimmy Lee Greer, construction man, United States Navy, uh, Houston, Texas, born October 2nd, 1947, so he was two years younger than me, taken from us as a casualty of war on the 4th of November, 1968. Um, that was moving to me to be able to uh, see his name on the wall and uh, spend some time there. Actually, I went there three times. I went once myself. I brought my wife there uh, one afternoon. And that evening I went back and I was there for like three hours. And uh, the expanse of names on that wall, watching the other people. Uh, I saw a lot of men bringing their families there. Um, there were all manners of uh, mementos left along the wall. And the thing that was overpowering was uh, all those names weren't just names. These were all people that lived, breathed. They had family, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, girlfriends. Um, and it just struck me as such a waste. And therefore, uh, I hope that we never have to endure um, another conflict like that, but unfortunately, as it says on the uh, Korean War memorial at Moran Square, freedom is not free. And um, a lot of people sacrificed, and at the time we felt it was for um, a just cause. Um, the jury may still be out on that to a point, but. Uh, there's only been a, a bit of closure uh, that's come to light recently uh, with the, with the uh, uh, dedication of the Vietnam uh, Memorial at the bridge at Moran Park where... Uh, that's here in Natick you're discussing. Right. Yes. Uh, you, you're feeling that you're finally being recognized because when I returned from the service, I basically, I didn't want to have anything to do with 
um, discussing the war at all, uh, the merits of it or anything else, and uh, all of the military clothing I had, um, I got rid of, and uh, I basically tried to put a lot of it out of my mind because uh, it wasn't that there was such a great sacrifice in terms of what others have endured on the battlefield. Because you, you've had individuals that you've interviewed that have been uh, recipients of the Purple Heart uh, from uh, whether it be World War II or the Korean War or Vietnam or whatever. Um, but the thing that injured a lot of people from the Vietnam era was uh, coming back to uh, this country and uh, the feeling that you were looked upon by society as a pariah. Um, the people that came back from uh, World War II had, uh, you know, large celebrations and parades and the like, and uh, here it was just to try to divorce yourself from it and assimilate into society and, you know, basically leave me alone. Peter, we thank you very much for coming here tonight and it's talking my pleasure. to us about this. We very much appreciate it. Thank you.